episode 30, talking about taxes. Interested in Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a very vague concept to a lot of people. Need to know more about cryptocurrency? We're going to talk about the basics. You know, this is something that people just have no idea about what crypto is. How about buying, selling, and mining? Tony, I think that's one of the things that's going to make us a little different from some other shows. We're getting our hands dirty. Then listen to Gary Leland and Tony Sakala, better known as the Crypto Cousins, on the Crypto Cousins Podcast. This week's price. The price of Bitcoin, $9,785. That's down $941.48 since last week, or 8.8%. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Welcome to the show. Gary Leland here. And this is Tony Sakala. Okay, Tony. What you doing there, Daddy-O? We're on the subject, one of your favorite subjects of all subjects in the world, I know. (laughs) Yes, yes. The first subject, that's the first subject that people mention. As soon as you sit down at the meetup, people look at me with big bug eyes and they go, oh my God, what am I going to do about the taxes? And I look at them with big bug eyes and I think to myself, how much are you making that you're so worried oh, yeah. about being taxed? Uh, it's like we're, we're, yeah. you know, people are, I, I invested $25 in Monero last month. Please. But you know, Tony, as we both know from the show we did, you cannot charge a person by the, the or you cannot judge a person's crypto by the person. It ought to be something like that. You can't judge a book oh. by its cover. You can't judge you can't uh, judge the amount of crypto mm-hmm. they have by their looks. Right, that's true. Yeah, they we had look a really like great a little time. grandma who doesn't know what they're mm-hmm. doing and they got a hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, Texas has a lot of very uh, wealthy, crypto-rich grandmas. Uh, they come to the meetups. They're like a little, um, you know, they sort of sit there and the, you just think, well, what are they going to ask? And they're like, oh, yeah, I've got my treasure and my portfolio and I'm listening to Cliff High and I'm doing all this stuff. And I'm like, whoa, these people are in the know. And tell me about the, the coins you're interested in. So, yeah, you cannot judge a book by its cover. We, we saw people shuffle up to us, obviously, uh, you know, kind of introverted folks who uh, maybe showering is not that important to them. It, you know, you still know what you're going to see in the tech space. <laughs> That's and why you put that <laughs> showering is not very important to you. <laughs> okay. Hey, I got a good one for you, Tony. I'm talking to this guy about the cards. You know, last episode we talked about cards that we're moving. We're moving out of these cards, and if people wanted to buy them, they could email us. And uh, I'm talking to this guy on the phone about the cards. And I'm telling him, I said, look, yeah, I'm like 63. I got no reason to make up this stuff to you. These are all good cards. Because <laughs> he's worried about it. And he goes, you're 63? And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're 63. <laughs> and I said, okay. And he goes, well, gosh, my dad's like 63 or his grandpa or somebody's 63. <laughs> and they don't have any clue what's going on. <laughs> I go, well, I'll start drooling soon. But at the moment... <laughs> I just, I think they just thought since I was able to carry on a conversation with him, you know, he was like 30. I must be in his age caliber. I thought it was kind of funny. He was so mm-hmm. shocked at my mm-hmm. age. I, I've mm-hmm. never had anyone that shocked. So um, that, that that was kind of funny, I thought. <laughs> but, hey, I want to make sure everybody knows. Well, cousin John is 72. That's true. John McAfee. John McAfee. Uh, we met a lot. There's a lot of older cousins. You know, they say uh, 60 is the new 30. So that means I can live to 100. So that sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. Hey, if anyone wants to make sure before we get into today's interview, I want to make sure you know, join our Facebook group. Just go to Facebook and search Crypto Cousins. Actually, Tony, I think we got one of the the, the most, I don't know if it's most active would be correct, but one of the nicest Facebook groups if you want to learn crypto. No one's going to jump on you Mm -hmm. for not knowing the answers already. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a very kind group. And uh, you can call us with comments. Our voice messages, our voice questions, 747-777-9471. So make That's sure. That's 747-777-9471. About a seven. So you know you're going to be lucky. Now, Tony, <laughs> today, this interview, you weren't there. You were busy the day, when, the day when I interviewed Mario Constance with Happy Tax. So I went ahead and did the interview by myself. So this is kind of new for you, too. 
Yes, I was out of town. I missed that interview. Yeah, so I talked to Mario. Um, we talked about taxes coming up April 15th. We thought we'd better get this out of here. Tony, my coffee sponsor. Yes, that's right. I have a coffee sponsor. A donut at the 7-Eleven gives me free coffee if I will talk Bitcoin and crypto with them. So my nice. coffee sponsor every week, Tony, goes, when are you doing that show on taxes? He's worried about his son. His son is almost gone full time into crypto. Uh-huh. And uh, he's concerned with his son, wanting his son to do it right. So I told him we would uh, contact someone and do a show on taxes. And that's, I contacted Mario with Happy Taxes. He seemed to know his stuff. He was actually an investor himself, not just some tax guy. He's a Bitcoin crypto guy. So I thought I couldn't think of a, I thought it'd be better to ask someone who's into crypto rather than just a tax guy, someone who knows what crypto is and understands how it works. That's a really good choice, Gary. Well, thank you. Well, instead of, after last week's show, we took it forever, and this interview probably takes too long, too. So we're going to, let's just go straight to the interview this week, Tony. All right. Mario, thank you for joining me on the show. I really appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about Happy Tax and yourself and, and your company, CryptoTaxPrep.com. I'm kind of confused. There's a lot of parts here. Sure. Yeah. Well, I've been a lifelong entrepreneur. Uh, started out over 20 years ago in a restaurant business. Uh, from there, I uh, got involved with the internet businesses uh, in 99 and uh, took a job for a short period of time. Uh, during that time. And after I sold my internet business, I took a tax class, just wanted to learn more about tax law as it pertains to being an entrepreneur. And I actually gravitated towards it. So I decided to start a little side tax business and uh, eventually uh, opened up a multi-service firm where we did taxes and credit services as well as mortgage banking and got involved with real estate development for a while. And clearly that crashed in 2009. So I uh, ended my mortgage and real estate operations uh, successfully, unlike many people that got crushed in it. Uh, we, we kind of bought right and still were able to get out uh, significantly. Um, and the uh, scenario from there was that um, I refocused back on my tax business after real estate ended. And I was able to convert to franchising uh, and utilize the power of franchising to scale from that one office to 99 offices in five states. Uh, Fast forward to 2014, uh, I sold those offices back to that franchisor and started my own franchisor called Happy Tax. Uh, It's an innovative, uh, differentiated model, uh, not your traditional brick and mortar. Uh, Our franchisees are virtual and mobile. Uh, they meet with their clients anytime, anywhere, utilize our mobile technology to, to source and submit tax return information. And then we've got a group of licensed U.S.-based CPAs that prepare those returns. Uh, the uh, company's been going amazing. A couple of years ago, I uh, being a, a CEO of a technology company and trying to stay at the forefront, uh, was hearing a lot about blockchain back in uh, 2016, and uh, got interested and started working on a, our own proof of concept for a blockchain tax preparation solution. And that kind of got me uh, immersed in the space and a lot of connections, a lot of friends. And when I saw it hitting mainstream in 2017, uh, we invested heavily in creating the crypto tax prep division of Happy Tax, which is uh, to service traders who uh, might not know the complexity and the nuances of uh, reconciling and uh, reporting their crypto trades for taxation purposes. And we've got over 100 CPAs and accountants working for us now, and the company's growing nicely. And a lot of people with a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, as it surrounds taxation of crypto, and uh, just looking to continue helping out in the space and uh, c- clear up that misconception. Well, so what I like what we do. What I like about that, Mario, is first of all, you got on the net in '99. That's yep. pretty early, really. That's yep. still early. In 2016, you started doing blockchain. You know, I, I heard you on another show, and you knew answers. You knew crypto. You weren't some guy who's just like, "Oh, here's what I do." You actually knew the information, and so that's why I wanted to bring you on. I had, I went into the Seven Eleven the other day. And the guy at the 7-Eleven knows I'm into crypto, and he goes, Gary, I need you to do an interview with someone 
about taxes and crypto. So the guy at the 7-Eleven is asking me for information. So people really want this information, I feel like. Um, how, do, how would you say someone like H&R Block is prepared to handle this? I mean, you know this space, but someone like your traditional H&R Block who – I'm not really going to say they're your competitor because I think you're kind of in a different uh, niche completely, but but a lot of people just go to them. So what would you say in, on that situation? Yeah, they've been around 50 years in the industry. Uh, they are the biggest provider, but they're a dinosaur when it comes to this specifically. They've put out two blog posts. They've done zero training for their preparers. We have uh, insiders that, uh, we hear some information from, from time to time. Uh, so they can't even service clients if you wanted them to. I mean, if you had done your complete, uh, reconciliation of all your crypto trades, which is the biggest part of this, that's challenging, uh, being that all the, 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 the space is raw, uh, all the technologies are new, uh, the data imports are not uh, aligned. So even if you did have all that, they might be able to prepare the return at that point in time, uh, but they're not going to know the nuances of uh, many of the different things that happen in crypto that do not happen in the rest of the world. So uh, so they're just not quite as prepared to handle this as a company like yours is, is basically what you're saying. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So I have a lot of questions here and I'm going to go through these. I have 23 questions. Awesome. So uh, I'm just going to start with number one. And these are questions I personally have. So okay. I find I, I, I'm pretty average Joe. If I have a question, other people may be wondering these same things. First of all, I want to know, what is the difference between currency and property? And why did the IRS make crypto uh, property instead of currency? So currency is if you were going to the airport and you see those currency trading booths and you're going to trade your dollars for your euros or your dollars for your yen uh, or whatever a country you may be visiting. Uh, and currency, when you make those types of trades, is not a taxable event. So, uh, you know, and clearly cryptocurrency is called currency, right? But uh, for the context of the IRS, they have deemed that cryptocurrency is not treated like currency, but it's treated like property for purposes of taxation. And uh, the, the reason behind that is that the cryptocurrency as a, generally as a whole with you know, a couple thousand coins these days uh, re generally represent interests in projects, much the way you would buy an interest in a company when buying a share. So it more resembles – uh, the way that uh, an investment is made in stocks than uh, a way someone would exchange currency. So clearly we know that one of the use cases of the many different cryptocurrencies out there is currency. Uh, but at the same time, it's very speculative and there's a lot of movement. There's, generally, currencies are very stable and there's not uh, scenarios where uh, you have big time movements or swings in the uh, volatility of specific, you know, uh, denominational currencies uh, like you do in crypto. So it's more akin to an investment, and that's why they deemed it as property uh, back in 2014. Well, some cryptos, I mean, we both know some cryptos are definitely like stocks, but some really are more like currency. But you're saying because of the fact, like Dash, for instance, to me, that and Litecoin are, are really real currencies. You know, but because of the fact they can swing in price so much is why they're property. Yeah, and also the fact that the majority of the people are not buying them to use them for currency. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it, generally they're buying them to invest in them. So uh, if, even though many of them are built as utility tokens, the, rea the, the core reality of why people are buying it is not because they're going to use it to go buy their groceries. It's because they want to – they believe in the project and they think that the, uh, there's going to be – uh, additional demand, which will increase the price. So do you think that in 10, 20 years, 30 years, when, you know, a lot of the currencies start, stop the drastic acceleration and have worked into the uh, everyday lives of Americans and people are buying online with Litecoin every day or Bitcoin or whatever, that would change? Or, or once it gets in there, it's pretty much done forever? Well, if I could predict what's going to happen 20 or 30 years from now, I don't know that I'd have to be sitting here talking to you today, even though I'm really enjoying it. Um, uh, okay, so fair enough, I fair think, enough. I think there's definitely going to be changes to the regulations. That's the one certainty, that what is the law and how crypto is treated today 
it will not be the, what the law is and how it's created, treated even five years from now. Uh, the government is making a very uh, intense look at how and what and if and can they regulate or what can they uh, do to make sure that people are staying safe in terms of not getting beat out of money and that people are paying taxes on their uh, gains, which is essentially what uh, yeah, that treatment of property creates is that you pay taxes on the increases uh, for cryptocurrencies that you've purchased. Okay, good. good. Thank you. Now, number two, Places like Coinbase, GDAX, which is Coinbase, or Kraken or whatever, if you do more than $20,000 in orders, they send you a 1099K, if I'm correct. Is that right? That is correct. And the thing I found interesting on that is it doesn't matter if you made $20,000. You could buy and sell, if I'm correct, 1000 worth of Bitcoins 20 times. And now you have something on uh, 1099K coming that you've got to include and keep your records on. That's correct. Yeah. So it's an aggregate of the amount of trades is what would trigger that 1099K. Now, 1099K is an informational statement. It's not a listing of what needs to be included in your tax return. Now, the flip side of that question is that whether or not you're issued a 1099K, uh, you are required to report all of your trades and transactions, uh, whether it be utilizing crypto to sell the crypto back to fiat, whether it be and that that in that context, it's whether you sell it back to fiat in your bank account or you send it back to a USD wallet is still a crypto trade that is reportable and taxable for purposes of taxation. Uh, even when you use coin to coin transactions, if you're using Bitcoin to buy Ethereum, that would be required to show a capital gain or loss on that Bitcoin transaction of what you sold it for versus what you bought it for. And even if you're using crypto to purchase goods and services, the gain or loss on what you purchased that crypto for versus what you sold it for is required to be reportable. So the 1099K is just kind of to put uh, the person on the radar with the IRS in a more meaningful upfront manner. Uh, but that does not, even if you didn't get one, it still doesn't exempt you from having to include these transactions for taxation purposes. And this is for all years. Uh, there has been no changes to crypto. I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, as we move along. Uh, but it, whether or not you just made a couple of trades, when you made them, they're all required to be reported. Uh, and the government is working on, uh, as I mentioned before, ways to get deeper in out in addition to that 1099k that they're sending for those $20,000 plus trip people uh, that that they are uh, essentially working on matching uh, data that's on the chain versus KYC data and they're working on ways to get a hold of all that KYC data uh, and most of the exchanges already have in their terms of service that they will release that information to any government agency that requests it. Okay, that gives me what you say gives me two questions. Um, number one, I have been, I have heard this several times on shows and different podcasts and stuff that when the new tax bill came out with the tax cuts and everything that it changed and uh, that crypto was now, if you change crypto for crypto, it was a taxable event where in 2017 before it wasn't. Is that true? It's not true. It's a complete misconception. Uh, I think it was triggered a lot by two very irresponsible articles from major publications, Bloomberg and Forbes, that use a clickbait type title in their uh, article uh, that referenced a change in the tax law uh, that was made uh, for 2018 forward, which said that 1031 exchanges or like kind exchanges were only allowable for uh, real estate transactions moving forward. Uh, that said, 1031 exchanges previously were available for other types of transactions, but specific types of transactions. Like if you sold a boat for a bigger boat, you were able to use a 1031 exchange uh, if it was for business purposes, clearly. Uh, they're only allowed for business purposes, 1031 exchanges. And 
it, the tax law reform did not change anything 2017 and backwards. Uh, that said, here's uh, a couple of analogies on why crypto to crypto trades were never uh, allowable to be used for 1031 exchange. It, it's 1031 exchange, for those of you that might not know, is really just a deferral of the capital gains. All that means is that you would defer it, which could be a good thing, but at the end of the day, you're still going to end up paying that tax at some point in time. So as two examples, if you sold Facebook stock for Microsoft stock uh, in exchange, uh, you cannot use a 1031 exchange for that. And as I mentioned before, the IRS is already deeming crypto very similar to stocks in purchase of that. Also, since you know we've got the terminology coin uh, as a big part of the space, if you if you traded a gold coin for a silver coin or vice versa, you cannot use a 1031 exchange for that ever either. Now, uh, in order to do a 1031 exchange, what you need to do is you need to basically request it from the IRS by including all of your trades on your tax form on form 1031. Uh, and essentially, if you did that in crypto, you're just setting yourself up for a letter that's going to say, hey, nice try. Uh, you, you can pay us those taxes that you just tried to defer, and you can pay us some penalties and interest for not paying them on time. And sometimes the IRS don't get to those letters for a year or two. And then, you know, it, oftentimes that those penalties and interest can wipe out the entire gain that is, uh, you know, trying to be avoided. And you know, certain by paying it up front, uh, utilizing tax minimization strategies are, are generally going to be better ways. So, uh, the final point I'll make on 1031 exchanges and why they're not uh, allowable uh, for crypto, the AICPA, which is the National Organization of, of Certified Public Accountants, uh, requested some guidance from the IRS on this specifically. A couple other national organizations did as well. The IRS has been silent for a number of years on that. If they were going to allow it, they would have just replied, say, sure. Uh, but they haven't replied yet, and their silence is usually deadly when it comes to the IRS. It means that they're you know, not ready to make an official position, but the Congress's intent has shown that the, they're, they're not going to allow it for 2017 only and, and not you know, 2018 moving forward. So uh, unfortunately, uh, those are not a viable way to avoid taxes on coin-to-coin transactions. Okay. Thank you, because I think a lot of people are confused on that, and they think sure. there's a big change that just happened, and if they were last year or before, they're covered, because it didn't count unless they cashed out in the fiat. So I think that's for Now, here's another scenario. This guy's got $50,000 worth of Bitcoin, and he panics because the market's dropping. He goes, ah, I got to get out of here. And so he sells everything in his Coinbase account, and his money's in his Coinbase account, and then he goes, man, what a... What an idiot I am. So he buys right back in, never takes the cash out of his Coinbase account. Because he cashed it and turned it into cash, even though he never took it out of Coinbase, does he have to pay taxes on that? Or since he yeah. put it right back in Coinbase, he never removed it out of Coinbase. Is it still whenever he finally pulls it out of Coinbase and, and takes the fiat into his bank account? Well, if he had a gain, if the price of the Bitcoin that he sold in that example was uh, more than the amount that he bought it for, the answer would be yes, he would. Uh, the Moving it back to your bank account is not the determinant on whether a trade or transaction is reportable and taxable. For instance, if you have stock in a brokerage account and you sell it, but you leave the money in the brokerage account, that's still reportable and taxable there. So the same thing applies here. Moving it to your bank account is actually irrelevant. Uh, the act of selling it itself, wherever that happens, is what uh, is the reporting requirement comes from. Okay. And now, uh, Bitcoin Cash. I've got Bitcoin. I get this Bitcoin Cash on this fork. I get it free. Do I have to do anything or do I have to worry, not worry about it until I cash out or change the Bitcoin Cash to another coin? So the scenario of Bitcoin Cash is that I'm using it, it as hard forks in general. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and, and all hard forks. Uh, when you get those additional coins, uh, which, as you mentioned, you're technically getting them for free, uh, you're essentially uh, having another asset. Now, you do not have to claim that asset as income or gain at the time you received it. So the time of the fork, when you received it. Uh, you do not have to include that on your tax return unless you sell it. So when you sell it, what happens is there's a couple of ways to handle it. You can either split the basis uh, from the Bitcoin and the Bitcoin cash in this example. 
uh, appropriately based on the percentage of the value that they were. Uh, so if you bought one Bitcoin and it was $10,000 at the time, and then Bitcoin split, and now you had one Bitcoin and one Bitcoin cash, uh, you can say, all right, I'm going to allocate zero basis, uh, zero cost to the Bitcoin cash. And then when I sell that Bitcoin cash, so let's say you sold it at 2000 bucks, you would have a gain of $2,000. Or you can allocate the appropriate amount uh, of the uh, percentages of the values of each of those coins to your basis. And you might apply, I think it's something like 27% or so, uh, which was what the value of the Bitcoin cash was compared, it might have been less off the top of my head, I don't recall exact number. Uh, apply a portion of that towards it. Uh, the, the caveat to doing that, and this is where kind of tax planning comes in, is that you would then reduce your basis on your Bitcoin, and then when you sold the Bitcoin, you would have a higher gain. So that's something that we work with our clients on a case-by-case -case basis. So it really depends a lot on whether or not you sold your Bitcoin cash first, or you held it, or you sold some of the Bitcoin. And uh, But yes, it would only come about to become an event at the time that you actually sold that forked coin. So I assume from what you're saying just then, that same exact information uh, or procedure or whatever would apply to me if I had mining income, if I had node income, if I had like steam it tips, no matter how I got currency, cryptocurrency, until I cash it, I'm not going to be in trouble or right, until I exchange it for fiat or another currency. I'm not like looking for trouble for the IRS for unreported income. Unfortunately not. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> uh, mining income is required to be reported at the time you receive it. It's, it's what's called self-employment income if you're doing it individually outside of a company. So uh, that becomes uh, goes on your Schedule C. If you're an individual, uh, you report the amount of mining rewards that you received throughout the year. You're also able to write off any expenses that you had that were directly related to that mining income. So your electricity, a portion of the space that you use to house that mining equipment, whether that be uh, a small exclusive space in a room that you have that equipment, whether it be a full basement, that you have a bunch of mining rigs set up, or you have a warehouse, uh, and any other direct costs of that mining income or other, you know, as you mentioned, tips or, or, or payables for goods or services that you provided. Uh, one a uh, really good tip, you know, tax planning tip for, for many of the traders out there that aren't mining is you may be able to write off uh, educational expenses that you're uh, undertaking uh, if you're attending conferences, if you're attending seminars that are paid, uh, anything that you're doing uh, that uh, is related directly to that mining uh, and in some cases actually create a loss. Now, you can't create losses forever and write that off, and that loss would off offset any other income you had or any trading income you had. Uh, so case by case, this has to be kind of discussed with a, with a tax advisor. However, you can have scenarios where you're able to get some additional write-offs that you would not get if you were only trading. So by even having you know, one mining rig, uh, you, know, you might be able to have some additional tax planning there for yourself. Oh, well, that's a, that's a pretty good selling point if you're selling mining rigs. <laughs> that sure someone is. can actually be making money and have some write-offs just from having a small rig. Yep. So um, that's interesting. So well, I, I didn't think that was going to be the case. So so let's say I'm mining this crypto and this crypto is worth $100 Okay. when I'm mining it. So yep. I've got a claim like this month I mine one at $100, one coin. Next mine I, month I mine one at 110 Next month I mine one at 120 So I've got to keep records like that. But then... I don't cash it out into fiat for five years. Now it's worth 700 a coin. So then I got to claim the profit from the 100, the 110, the 120 up to the 700 when I cash it out? That's correct. Yeah. So there's two events there. So you have both the, the income that you're receiving when you're receiving it as self-employment income uh, as well as the gain on that because it's property. So you receive property and when you receive property uh, for goods or services, including mining income, the scenario becomes that that's self-employment, and then it, that property appreciates in value. You have to pay capital gains taxes on those appreciated assets. And so if I go buy a hat, which I know the answer to this, but 
I go online, I see a hat I want, and they take Bitcoin, so I pay for it. All of a sudden, I got to put down that I just made $15 on my income because I bought a hat with the Bitcoin, which I was I bought for $100 maybe, and now it's worth $10,000, so I got to figure out what that profit was, what percentage was $15. That's correct. It's unfortunate, but it's correct. There's a lot to keep up with on it crypto. It sure is. Yeah. A lot, the, the mining is what got me. So how about your... Are you familiar with mining pools? To some extent, yeah. Right. So how about you're mining with a mining pool and your money's in the mining pool and you've never actually put it in your own personal wallet? So is the guy in the mining pool responsible for that? So when the mining pool is making distributions, it really depends a lot on how the setup is of the pool. Um, you know, is it a company? Are they going to issue distribution statements? Um, or are they just sending you... Uh, the mining rewards as they're coming? Are they holding them for a future date? They're holding it for a future date for me to take. Yeah. So if you haven't received those yet, uh, that would not be taxable event for you until you've actually received them from the pool. So would the mining pool be responsible for that? Because somebody made some money. Yeah. I mean, by rights, the, the mining pool should be uh, either taking care of the uh, taxes and scenarios there or uh, allocating uh, a portion of that to those in the pool so that they can pay their appropriate share. Okay. Okay, now we hit on this a moment ago. You said if you were making this money mining, you have to pay your self-employment taxes, which Correct. right now, you know, I pay my income taxes and, and I pay, what, 7% Social Security and my employer pays 7% Social Security if I'm doing my, if my memory's working, right? They help me out kind of. But if you're mining and you're not doing it through your company, then you're responsible for 14% right off the bat of the income. Correct. Right? There's actually 15.3% 15, 15 total is the self-employment tax. So uh, when people work on a, in a W-2 wage type job, uh, they do have money withheld for Social Security and Medicare. Uh, and again, that is split from the employee and the employer. Uh, so many employees don't even know that uh, the employers are kicking in to help them out. And they're actually, their wages are actually higher than they The employer uh, sure know. <laughs> yeah, we sure know. You're right. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, the IRS and Congress said at some point, okay, we got all these great people that are, uh, you know, doing their own thing and making money uh, outside of that type of arrangement. And we've got no way to get that money into their Social Security and Medicare funds. So they created the self-employment tax, which is in addition to the income tax, and it's 15.3% of your net profit. So in the mining example, you've got X that you brought in, Y that you paid out, Z is your profit, which is you know X minus Y, and the, the, that final profit number, 15.3% of that is due in self-employment tax along with the tax return. All well, gets put into the same bucket. Uh, and figured out in terms of, you know, it may eat up some of your refund. It may actually cause an additional tax uh, liability owed. And the, you know, you're, so you're getting hit with anywhere from zero to 39.6% in income taxes and then the 15.3% uh, in self-employment taxes. Now you do get to deduct half of your self-employment taxes incurred as an adjustment to income, which is like an above the line deduction uh, on your return as well. So it gets a little complicated. I will say not to freak people out that most people are not in that 39.6% rate. Uh, depends on the filing bracket, but generally that means you're making hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. Uh, most people are, you know, in the zero to 15% or maybe up to 25% uh, regular income tax rates. And the benefit of the whole self-employment side is you're getting to write off those expenses. So you're not paying uh, taxes on the total amount, only the net, which is unlike what happens when you do work a W-2 job and have payroll where you don't get to write off those expenses off the top. You can take deductions, but it's different. Oh, okay. Now, I'm not going to get all these questions asked, I know, because this is going on <laughs> much longer. This is more information. This is great information, and I appreciate it. But I got a couple more I want to get to if I can. Okay. I buy crypto, um, and in a month, I make $10,000. So I put in 10 and a month from now, I take out $20,000 and go, boy, I did great. I made $10,000. And I go, you know, I'm going to uh, do that again. So I put in uh, another $10,000. Now I've lost nine on my investment. Okay. So how much did I make in taxable income? 
So in that scenario, if it was very clean and just you know uh, one trade for purposes of this example, where you kind of bought something at ten, sold it at twenty, at that point in time you've got a ten thousand dollar gain. The next month uh, you bought it at ten and you lost nine, you've got a nine uh, you got a nine thousand dollar loss. You would have only made one thousand dollars. It all gets piled up into a bucket at the end of the year uh, and compiled to see what the total uh, net profit or net capital gain is from your trading activity, and you would only pay taxes on that $1,000 in that example. So and there's no difference short- on the way taxes are based on profits versus losses. Correct. It all, it all kind of gets uh, tallied up, and whatever the net is after all of the trades is what you're taxed on. Okay, I give my uh, buddy um, a Bitcoin. Am I taxed on this? Or as my buddy, I gave a Bitcoin to tax on this. Or I, my buddy okay. says, hey, would you buy me some Bitcoin? I don't have an account. And you buy him the Bitcoin. He gives you $1,000 or 10000 You buy him a Bitcoin and give it to him on a thumb drive. So before I answer it, are you giving away Bitcoins or just want to make <laughs> yeah, sure? Yeah, I got a ton of them over here. It's too bad you're um, not in Arlington because you have to walk up to me in person. <laughs> Got it. So uh, th- there's a lot of people that, that have that same scenario in question because there's been many people that maybe weren't as technologically advanced or didn't know how to do it or didn't have the ability to get through KYC checks. Um, so when you give someone uh, something, it could be a gift. You can gift up to $14,000 per year uh, per person. Uh, you have uh, no tax liability um, on that. However, uh, what happens there is that your basis, what you purchased it for, passes to the person that you gave it to. So if you bought that coin for 10000 and it grew to 20000 and then you gave it to your pal um, and then he goes to sell it, even if he sold it at, at 20000 without any additional gain, he'd pay a $10,000 capital gain. So it's really not a tax planning strategy. I know that some people have kind of said, well, I'm not going to sell it. I'm just going to give it to somebody and that'll avoid taxes. It really just defers it. So the people receiving it generally are not, you know, are not in a good position as a result of receiving it uh, because they end up getting hit with those capital gains in those scenarios. Okay. And then um, I want to explain this because I, I didn't know this and I thought this was real important. First in, first out. Can you explain that? Sure. So uh, there's a number of different ways you can account for transactions. Uh, so if you bought one Bitcoin a couple of years ago, one Bitcoin last year, and then you're going to go and sell a Bitcoin, generally the rule of thumb is that the IRS says that you have to uh, account and utilize FIFO, first and first out, uh, on that transaction to state that you're not selling the one that you just bought last year. Uh, you're selling the first one you bought. Uh, it's just it's the most commonly accepted accounting uh, method uh, from the IRS. Now that said, uh, this is where things can get a little tricky and things can get a little um, beneficial depending on the scenario. Now, if you have them commingled in one wallet, you're probably going to have to use FIFO. Uh, if you have them in different wallets, there may be some ability to use LIFO, mm. last in, last out. I see what uh, you're saying. There's a number of other intricacies that go into determining if that is going to be applicable. Um, I will say that the IRS is not going to uh, look friendly upon you know someone that bought uh, or received a bunch of Bitcoin you know very early, early adopters in the space and have been buying since, and all of a sudden now they start selling some and say, all right, we'll just leave the other ones and not pay the gain on those. So it's really something that you need to advise with your account and your CPA on uh, which method will be applicable to you based on your overall scenario uh, and and make sure that you fit the requirements if you're going to attempt to use uh, the other types of uh, accounting methods. How about uh, things like ShapeShift where there's no uh, know your customer? So ShapeShift will be an in and out. Uh, there will be a record of it with your uh, exchange, generally the out and the in back in. Uh, and it's all on the chain. So the information still needs to be reported. Uh, when you're sending something to ShapeShift, 
uh, or Changely or one of the other tools for that matter, uh, you are selling that particular coin. So you want to change Bitcoin for Ethereum, you send your Bitcoin at Shapeshift, that is a sale of the Bitcoin, and then you're receiving back Ethereum in this scenario, and nothing happens there until you sell that Ethereum. So they are still reportable uh, and taxable events, and you know the data is there and able to be compiled, although it's not always easy. Uh, it's definitely out there and it's on the chain. Okay, and then let me end up with this last one because I know I've taken up way more of your time probably than you planned. Are there some tools? I think I heard you recommend some tools for people to help them make this easier. Yeah, so there's actually a number of four or five tools that are trying to come onto the market now, all of of which have come to us to try to get some guidance based on our industry leadership position and the number of clients that we're servicing now. Uh, The two tools that we use right now and we have corporate partnerships with are bitcoin.tax and cointracking.info. Both of them are great. They'll allow you to uh, pull down the data from the various exchanges and wallets into one uh, compilation that will enable the uh, capital gains and loss to be calculated and then ultimately uh, brought into tax software for a professional to use or In many cases, you can self-prepare, which we don't recommend with the rawness of this space, Uh, although 40% of people overall in the country do self-prepare. So those tools, uh, I will say, though, are not out-of-the-box accurate. Uh, Oftentimes, in almost every case, you're going to have to have to do some manual crypto bookkeeping and reconciliation, and that's one of the services that we provide. So you will have to tidy up uh, many trades that have no cost basis uh, associated with them because the data just flows that way. Uh, you'll have many trades that are in there and and showing as if they are uh, sales, but yet they're not because here's one uh, piece that we haven't spoken about yet. If you move crypto from one wallet or exchange to another wallet or exchange that you own, that's not a reportable or taxable transaction. But the data sources don't realize that. They don't know that when you sent your money from you know, Coinbase to Bittrex that that wasn't a sale. So those transactions have to be manually backed out of most of these tools. Uh, and that's where our team comes in to kind of handle all that for our clients. Uh, but it is also definitely possible for people that have a high tolerance for pain <laughs> and uh, uh, dealing with uh, very highly detailed uh, you know, accounting items to do it themselves as well. Okay, excellent. So now, where I want to make sure I, I've said this in the pre-show, but I want to make sure people know where to go to find your site and get in touch with you um, because I, I think a lot of people are not aware of what their liability could be, and they're gonna. There aren't a lot of people I think that are able to help them that have the knowledge. I mean, you you're able to answer every question, and you know crypto. Yeah, and so does my team. So um, we're located at CryptoTaxPrep.com is the best way to contact us. You can talk to us through the site. We've got Facebook Messenger uh, chat built right into the site. If you have any preliminary questions, uh, those would be the primary ways. Our phone number is on there too. Uh, You can always call in 844-426-1040. And uh, we're more than happy to help out uh, all of your listeners. And I believe you had given me a code earlier. For our listeners, for a uh, hundred dollars off, um, it was Cousins One Hundred. And what's the scoop on that? And how did they use that? So, if you decide you wanted to utilize us for our service, uh, you would go to the checkout page and input that code, and it would automatically take a hundred dollars off of your price of the package. And the packages all include uh, complete reconciliation and bookkeeping, as we just discussed about. The full accounting, which is kind of talking about the different accounting methods and, and making that assertion as to what would work for you and not get you in trouble. Uh, full CPA tax preparation for not only the crypto side, but your entire return, other income as well, as well as advisory and access to one of those tools is included with our packages as well. So it's, a, it's kind of a set it and forget it. Let us handle it. All the work is guaranteed. Make it as easy as possible for uh, people to not have to get stressed out over this or worry if they're doing it right. And that's Cousins 100, and, and openness to everybody, that is an affiliate code. So is there anything, Mario, that I 
may not have gone over that you feel like um, we need to tell people about either your company or you or crypto in general? I want to make sure that we get everything in here that you think is needed. I just, like I said, I just had a list of questions on my mind, but uh, I want to make sure uh, since you spent the time with me, Pete, that you get to say everything you want to say. Yeah, I think, I mean, two high level things that I, I don't think we touched on is long term and short term capital gains. Uh, you know, if you hold on to a coin for over a year, it becomes a long-term gain, which is taxed at a lower rate. Uh, long-term capital gains are taxed at anywhere from 0% to 20%. And when I say 0%, some people do not have to pay capital gains tax because they don't have enough income. So it really depends on your filing status and how much overall income, including your capital gains, are on how much tax you're going to pay. Most people end to tend towards the lower end of that, uh, you know, 0%, 5%, 10%. Uh, is where most capital gains would be for uh, long term for most income levels. Uh, short term capital gains are higher. They're actually taxed at your ordinary tax rate. So whatever your tax rate is, that's what you pay taxes on uh, for your capital gains on short term crypto trades. Uh, those rates range from 0% to 39.6%. Again, with most people being towards the bottom end of that. Uh, I will say, though, from a business perspective and entrepreneurship and you know, also a lover of crypto and what it really brings to our society, uh, don't necessarily hold on to stuff that's garbage just because you want to get it into long term. I mean, run your business and deal with the taxes. And there's a lot of tax minimization strategies that, that we work with with our clients, um, you know, one of which is, you know, tax loss harvesting uh, that enables people to lock in some losses to offset some other gains. Uh, it's probably a more, more detailed conversation than we have time for here. But the other thing that I really want to touch on um, is what's called FBAR requirements. Uh, if you have over $10,000 in aggregate over uh, in overseas exchanges in crypto, uh, you have to file FinCEN forms. This is a requirement, not necessarily from the IRS, although the IRS, we can actually send it directly to the IRS. Uh, some of our competitors, TurboTax, cannot. So you have to kind of go try to figure out how to manually do it. Um, it that you have to report those holdings uh with a FinCEN form. And if you don't, the penalties start at $10,000 per occurrence. Uh, they can go up to $121,000 per occurrence. And the reason for this is this was put together so that people don't fund the overseas terrorist organizations. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's very important that if you are trying to file yourself or if you, if you are working with an accountant that might not know the space, uh, and all the different scenarios, or they might, you might not know, or they might not know, even if the exchange is overseas or not. We have a list uh, that uh, you have to file these forms, or you're in big trouble. So um, those are, uh, I think, the key two things that we did not really get to touch on here. But uh, overall, uh, you know, crypto is taxable, and there's ways to to minimize that. Um, and uh, we're happy to help if anyone needs us. So just just now talking in conversation, I've heard that like so small amount of people have claimed profits in crypto over the years. Are they just going to be a buttload of people in big trouble? There sure is. So, I mean, uh, many people here may know about the Coinbase case. The IRS sued Coinbase initially for access to all of their clients. Uh, and then they negotiated before they went into the lawsuit. And, and they said, you know what, lawsuits take a really long time. And this could take years and years and years. Uh, let's agree to limit the number of people uh, included in this suit to only people that traded an aggregate of $20,000 per year for the years 2013 to 15 for now. And they agreed, IRS agreed to that. Coinbase agreed, all right, we'll agree to an expedited case in return for that. Uh, Coinbase ended up losing that case and they have turned over or are in the process of turning over 14,000 people that uh, I would say probably 13,200 people that did not claim their uh, crypto trades because in 2015 only about 800 people did. Now the space is a lot different now than it was in 2015. Uh, clearly, really only the innovators were there. Uh, as we got into you know 2016, many of the early adopters came into the space, and then 2017, a lot of the mainstream uh, has started to trade. So uh, the those people are in big trouble. They've got penalties and interest and fines coming to them, and that, that's only the first blow that the IRS has made here. They are 
working on getting all the data from all the exchanges, uh, the KYC data, uh, which they then can easily match on the chain. I mean, one of the things here is that crypto is not necessarily anonymous. Clearly, the wallet address may not be precisely tied back to you until the KYC data is tied. However, it's a public ledger. It's the easiest thing in the universe for the IRS to audit ever. And they're building out systems to do that right now. They're working with a firm called Chain Analysis. Uh, that's a you know high-tech blockchain company, a uh, very well-respected company within the space. And they're rolling out forensics to uh, catch people in many other ways. Even what you mentioned before, people that get tips <laughs> or have their wallet addresses online, uh, the IRS is scanning for those and tying them back. And those people, you know, it's easy to just look in that wallet online in the public ledger and see how much crypto has been received. And if that doesn't match to what's been reported, uh, you know, it's a painful scenario to have to deal with the IRS under these audits and under these letters. They don't, uh, you know, just kind of send you a letter and say, hey, let's talk about this. They send you a letter and say, you owe us X unless you can prove us differently. So, uh, Highly recommend to everyone to uh, report properly, stay in compliance. You don't want to have to deal with the nonsense. And uh, that's pretty much uh, a big issue for many people. That's scary sounding already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, um, like I said, I'll have the links that uh, were mentioned in the show notes along with uh, the links to um, to your site. And I, I just appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for coming on Great. the show. I, I think this was valuable information. Thank you so much, Gary. I really appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. anybody needs some help, just let us know. Take okay, care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show, Tony. Hopefully, they have a little bit of information that may help them not to get in trouble. I hope so. I hope so, too. Seems like to me, everybody thinks that the IRS is, or not everybody, a lot of people think the IRS has no idea how much Bitcoin you have or what you've bought and sold. I think a lot of people are getting in trouble and going to get in trouble because they're doing this day trading and back and forth and back and forth and not keeping any records. And all of a sudden, that number that gets reported in 20,000, it's like 500,000. And they hadn't reported anything. So, you guys, we're not financial mm-hmm. advisors, but I think you guys need to, you know, be careful. Make sure you pay your taxes. Make sure you do your stuff right, because I don't think you want those guys messing with you. I don't think they're very nice when they think you owe them money. Well, I think... Getting some guidance from Mario today was a really smart move. I feel like we did the responsible thing. I agree completely. Hey, big thanks for everyone that's listening and subscribing and those who are leaving reviews, especially those who are leaving reviews on iTunes. If you're not leaving reviews and you're on your phone right now on iTunes listening, scroll down, push the five-star review. That's all you got to do. Just scroll down the page. It's not very hard. Scroll down the page. Give us a five-star review. We appreciate it very much. If you're not uh, on your phone listening, you're listening on our site, subscribe at CryptoCousins.com slash subscribe. Anything else you want to say before we get out of here, Tony? I think that's it. Okay. Well, in that case, adios, muchachos. And to all the cousins out there in the Crypto Cousin land, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Crypto Cousins podcast. Please share this podcast with anyone you know that is interested in cryptocurrency. Your friends can subscribe on iTunes at CryptoCousins.com slash iTunes and on Android at CryptoCousins.com slash play. If you want to know more about Tony or Gary, just go to TonySakala.com or GaryLeland.com. Make sure and join us on the next episode. And thanks for listening. The Crypto Cousins podcast and information in the podcast are not intended as investment advice. Cryptocurrencies are risky. Never invest more than you can afford to lose. Always seek professional advice before making any investment. Investing in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies may present tremendous risks. Please understand that you are using any and all information available on or through the Crypto Cousins podcast at your own risk. 